Hello everyone, thanks for being here. Um, I'm sorry that this situation um, has made this uh, conference uh, fully online, but I hope that uh, we all enjoyed uh, from the presentation of everyone, I, I'm certainly I'm doing. Um, thank you again to the organizers for inviting me. Um, and today I will be talking about uh, some recent work that we have been doing about how to model through uh, using data um, COVID-19, which uh, is the responsible of the current situation of emergency that we all are uh, experiencing worldwide, with uh, around 14 million people that have been already confirmed to have gone through COVID-19, leading to roughly 600,000 deaths. Uh, I would like to note that these uh, 14 million uh, it's a huge number, but it's really a lower bound because uh, there is a lot of asymptomatic transmission, people that have experienced the disease, but they don't have uh, developed symptoms. And that means that likely the real number of people that have been infected by this SARS-CoV-2 virus is around of the order of 100 million or so uh, worldwide. Uh, the current situation is just that uh, there are second wave of uh, um, outbreaks uh, in many parts of the world, and there are a few countries, uh, very large countries that are still experiencing the, the first uh, wave, let's say, and they are going through that. Uh, so these numbers are not uh, the final ones, and unfortunately, both the number of total confirmed cases and the global death uh, will be uh, likely to increase in the next uh, few weeks and, and months. Um, COVID-19 is a disease, it's a new disease which we uh, didn't know before, of course, we, we knew that uh, at some point there would be a global pandemic uh, because we already got in the past signals of that this was very likely uh, with uh, outbreaks like Zika, uh, Ebola that uh, fortunately have been uh, limited to some countries in Africa, but uh, the H1N1, uh, the SARS uh, uh, in 2015, uh, MERS, etc. So there are a lot of these emerging diseases that were still uh, sending signals that this could be uh, eventually become global and unfortunately uh, COVID-19 is this case. So we have um, now learned a lot about the disease that we didn't know when it started but anyway we were working on developing more uh, state-of-the-art methods that include um, our current um, patterns of mobility, the way of life, how we interact, etc., into the models, so that we were a little bit more or less prepared for, for to model this, this sort of disease, even if we have to learn, uh, as the diseases evolve, uh, some aspects of the natural history of the disease. So, uh, essentially, when you are modeling this sort of diseases, everything is reduced to for uh, ingredients that are fundamental if you want to accurately model the uh, evolution of the disease. Uh, one is how the disease is transmitted. Uh, this is something that we more or less know uh, to some extent with for COVID-19. We, we, we know that there are different ways in which the disease can be uh, transmitted. This is um, human to human transmission uh, and is a, is a disease that is transmitted by the air. It's, uh, um, so there are different ways that still there are some debate about where this is uh, air bombed, uh, droplets, uh, um, etc. But is human to human and then is transmitted by the air. So it does. It means that you don't need a vector like, for example, when you study Zika or dengue, you don't need a vector that mediates the transmission of the disease uh, among humans. Uh, the other thing that you need to learn is what are the stage of the disease, the dynamical stage. So we know that uh, normally in a disease you have the susceptible state and the infectious and the uh, removed one that corresponds to people that recover or people that death, uh, die uh, as a result of the disease. In this case, uh, we know that we have more compartments than the three simple ones. And I will describe in detail uh, which one are those uh, stage, but we know more or less what are the different compartments through which an individual goes when it, it gets infected and, and sick of the disease. Um, the last two ingredients that are the harder to incorporate into models are related to human behavior. So is one is how the disease is transmitted, is spread 
from one individual to the other, but not by which way of contagion, let's say, but how the disease is spread through our um, network of contact. So uh, we move, and as if we are sick, we bring the disease to other places when we move to these other places. So we need to know and incorporate into the model mobility patterns, uh, interaction patterns, um, what kind of uh, habits we have uh, if we meet, uh, uh, I mean, if we work on, on a place that, uh, I don't know, is crowded, for example, if we if we are, are civil servants and then we, we interact with a lot of people uh, all days, or if we just uh, work at, at a place in which essentially we are two or three, all these things uh, have uh, an impact on modeling the spread of the disease. And finally, human behavior, because uh, it's now that we react to the pressure of the disease. So this is also uh, something that we need to learn how to incorporate into models the way in which we react to the pressure of the disease. Either naturally, because we perceive the risk and then we adapt, uh, adapt our behavior, or impose when we are giving instruction as to how to react to the pressure of the disease, for example, by quarantining, by isolating, or when we are under lockdown, that we our mobility is reduced uh, dramatically and then we have to, to follow the rules. Uh, this is actually another thing that is uh, subject to a lot of investigation is whether we uh, adhere to the to this sort of, of, of measures and, and instructions um, and we complain with that or not. Uh, mathematically we can model the COVID-19 in different ways. Uh, the susceptible infected susceptible is a very simple model that uh, doesn't describe the natural history of the disease because uh, even if we don't know to what extent, we certainly know that when you get sick, you get some degree of immunity, so you are not go, once you are recovered, you, you don't go back to the susceptible state immediately. So SIS models like are, are completely uh, inadequate to describe this disease. Uh, the, those that are more or less fit to describe this are models that consider that you have uh, susceptible individuals, infected individuals, and what we call removed, that include those that recover and those that died. Between susceptible and infected, however, it's very important for the COVID-19 to include the exposed or, or if you want the latency uh, state and not only that but to divide that in two branches because there is a lot of asymptomatic transmission. So that means that when you get the infections because you are susceptible and you enter into uh, contact with uh, infectious individuals or, or individuals that have not developed symptoms but are at the presymptomatic state, then you go to two branches. One is the uh, asymptomatic branch in which you you are uh, in, you incubate the, the virus and eventually you get um, in, you are infectious. Uh, but you don't notice, you don't develop symptoms or, 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 or only mild symptoms, so you are you recovered uh, without almost noticing that you were sick. Uh, and then the, the symptomatic uh, path in which uh, um, you have uh, incubation period, then you have people that are presymptomatic, so they have not developed symptoms, but they are already infectious, and this is important. Uh, we, we are still trying to adjust these parameters to see how much people, uh, how much of the infections are due to asymptomatic uh, transmission or symptomatic or presymptomatic transmission. But essentially you have this second branch in which once you are infected you can recover and um, remain at home or, or you can uh, remain at home but then at a later stage you get worse and then you have to be hospitalized or even you need uh, ICU care and, and ventilation, etc. So this is SEIR like models in which you have the susceptible exposed infections and, and recover or remove the state. Uh, this is the one that we are going to use in the in the next. And in order to couple this uh, model with um, the populations, we are going to use data-driven models at different scales. Before going into that, let's also say that uh, for COVID-19, the disease phase diagram is as usual. Uh, so we have a macroscopic outbreak if the number uh, R0, which is the number of secondary cases that is generated by uninfected individuals in an otherwise fully susceptible population, 
is larger than one. If this number is larger than one, that means that on average you generate more than one secondary case, case and, and that could lead to exponential growth if this continues to be so. If R0 is uh, at some point below 1 and remains below 1, that means that you are generating less than 1 secondary cases and the number of infectious individuals in time will decrease and that means that the uh, disease eventually will die out. This is very important, of course, for COVID-19. We are not anymore uh, discussing whether we are um, above or below uh, the the outbreak because once the outbreak take place it's, it means that the R0 is uh, above 1 but uh, we can work with um, um, R, uh, um, RT which is um, the dependence of R in time and to do that we need to uh, take into account uh, what are the factors that influence the uh, variations of R of R0. Um, the first one is transmissibility. The transmissibility um, involves uh, how likely it is that you transmit the disease if you are, if you are sick. Um, this is something that um, can be modified, of course, during the course of the disease. For example, if you wear masks or if you wash your hands, you reduce the risk of transmitting or getting the disease. Um, the second one is the um, infectious time, so how, how long are you exposed to get the disease? Uh, normally this is uh, related to the recovery time, so if you are infectious and you are infecting other people, you are doing that while you are infectious, uh, but uh, in general it also depends on, on, on how long you interact with other people, so the longer you interact with other people, the more likely it is that you uh, transmit the disease. So this is something that you can also control or you can somehow regulate if you um, for example, reduce your exposition to uh, other people. If you are infected, if you self-isolate at home, then you, you, you are um, not spending time with others and, and therefore this reduces the R0. And finally, the number of contacts that you have. Of course, if, if you have a large number of contacts, then potentially you can uh, become the super spread and you can um, spread the disease to many people. This is uh, the number that is varied or is changed when, when you adopt this sort of lockdown measures in which uh, um, you reduce the interaction with other people, you remain at home uh, or, or you try to keep the social distance or the number of effective people that you uh, are in contact with is reduced and that therefore the reproductive number is also reduced. So this means that in order to be realistic in your model you have to consider networks of interaction, you have to consider not only the disease parameters but you have also to consider how you interact with other people and to what extent you are exposed or you expose others to uh, the virus. This means that you have to consider what we call the structural populations, which means that the population is not anymore uh, a well-mixed population in which everybody has the same probability of interacting with everybody else. Um, in order to do that, we can do we can build metapopulation models like the, the one represented in the top uh, left panel of the figure, in which uh, each subpopulation is, uh, represents an urban area and the subpopulations are connected by, for example, mobility patterns, by, by trains or by uh, air transportation, etc. Of course, you can go to a low scale, uh, lower scales and, for example, you can look into the subpopulations and add also some structure to the subpopulation. Like, for example, you can um, consider that people are organized or in, in layers of interactions, for example, um, the household layer, which is important because a lot of contact take place there, but it's reduced to a few people. But then you have the workplace and that depends on, on where you work. You can have a lot of contacts or just a few, but also the community layer, which is which represents random encounters when you move or, and, and people um, interact with others just uh, by random people that you don't know but uh, when you get uh, I don't know into the metro or, or you go to a convenience store you interact with people that you don't know but this is these are interactions that are potentially um, that potentially could induce some new uh, infection so you have to take those into account as well finally before entering into more details of the models that we are going to discuss let me just say it also that uh, when you face a disease um, 
you have to come up with methods to reduce the number of people that get the infection. Uh, normally, this is done uh, through immunity. Uh, the population gets some immunity uh, to the disease, and this can happen in two different ways. One way is because you have a vaccine and you vaccinate your population, um, and the other one is because people go through the disease and they get this acquired immunity because they recover of the disease and they are immune to the disease. In the case of COVID-19, this second path is really dangerous because um, the transmissibility is very high. There are a lot of people that uh, get the infections in a very short time window, but the problem is that many of these people develop symptoms that are severe enough as to need uh, a specific care. And then this means that you can uh, eventually you will saturate your um, healthcare system, um, not only regarding hospitalization, but more importantly, those that need uh, ICU care, uh, ventilation, etc. So there will be a lot of people that will die as a result of lack of attention or specific attention, not because of the disease uh, itself, but because they, will, they w wouldn't be uh, able to receive the attention that they that they need. So this is rule out. And regarding the immunization via traditional vaccination, it's very hard to achieve in the short time because you need uh, quite some time to develop the vaccine, then to uh, produce it, and then to distribute this. Um, so in this case, the uh, herd immunity in, in the short time is, is like a chimera, so it's something that is, is hard to achieve. Uh, fortunately, uh, the herd immunity, the level of herd immunity, that is the minimum fraction of the population that you need to be uh, immune to the disease so as to protect the rest of the population, is not as high as, as the measles. For example, the half are not equal to 12, and then you will need uh, around 92% of the uh, population to be uh, vaccinated to, to be protected. Um, in this case, it's around two thirds because R0 is around 2.53. So it's around 60, 65, two thirds of the population. But anyway, in that case, in, in this case, we are talking about the global outbreak. So we will need a lot of people to be vaccinated. So essentially, billions of people to be vaccinated. So, um, in terms of what we have done to model uh, COVID-19 using data-driven model, we have used meta-population approach as the one that I just described. We have been also using data-driven uh, simulations and analysis uh, because we, 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 we have some data about how people move, etc., how they interact. And finally, we have also explored the use of agent based modeling to propose some specific policies to contain and mitigate the effects of the, of the disease. So let's start by what we did from, from with China. Uh, as you know, the, the virus, uh, uh, this disease originated in Wuhan, in the province of Wuhan in, in China, uh, in late December, and, and the Chinese authorities um, reported this uh, by the end of 2019 for the first time. Uh, and they were starting and they take, uh, took some measures at the very beginning, uh, reducing the mobility of people in the hope that this will contain the spreading of the disease both in China and worldwide. Unfortunately, that was not the case. And as you can see in this figure, the reason is very simple is because when you compare a panel A and B, which represents the mobility around the Spring Festival in 2019 and 2020, you see that um, in 2019, you have like two ways. One way that is uh, one or two weeks before the Spring Festival, in which people start to move to the place where they will be celebrating this Spring Festival. And then once this is, this is, uh, this is finalized, then you go back home. So essentially, around the Spring Festival, what you have is the minimum of mobility in that period. And the travel restrictions that were imposed in China were, were imposed exactly around this Spring Festival. So that means that it, they were imposed around the minimum uh, um, flux of, of uh, outflow of people from one place to the other, and that the first wave of movement had already taken place. That means that you were not able to prevent people to move freely and, and, and spread the virus. Of course, this is something that um, has to do as well with the natural history of the disease because there were, as I was mentioned, a large fraction of people that are asymptomatic, around 90% of people that uh, experience the disease uh, are 
estimated to be uh, asymptomatic. So that means that there are a lot of people that you don't detect that go undetected. And if you implement the sort of measures that you used to implement when you have these sort of emergencies, like for example, measuring temperature in the airports, etc., this is completely useless if the people, if, if those that are uh, transmitting the disease are symptomatic because you, you, you cannot detect it. So in this paper, uh, you can see more details of what we have done, some involve some simulations, etc. But this is, I think, the, the, the main message is that even if travel restriction played uh, some role uh, delaying the, the spreading of the disease, it was not possible to completely stop the spreading of the disease because the adoption, the adoption of this measure was too late, so past the first wave of, of movement. Second uh, sort of study that we did involved uh, early stage in Spain. Again, is data driven, and we what we implemented here is again a meta population model in which each subpopulation corresponds to a province in in Spain. We have fifty two of these, and we were able to um, gather uh, data about origin destination matrices of of how people move between these provinces in Spain. Uh, and this was disaggregated by um, transportation modes. So we, we got data about how people move by airplane, coach, car, ship, um, and train. And then you can aggregate all, so you can see this in C. Note that in Spain, there is a very clear uh, centralized pattern of mobility that goes through Madrid. This is the center of, of, the, of the map. And you see that when you uh, look at the airplane mobility, coach mobility, car, or even trip, all of them go through Madrid, which is this central central node. So that means that um, one hypothesis that you can you can make is okay. If what what I will expect is that given the pattern of mobility in Spain, um, the spreading pattern will depend on, on this, and then I will see different patterns depending on whether I see the disease. So if the disease is sit in Madrid, that should be different to if, if I see the disease in other parts of the country. And actually this is the case if you look at this. For example, we, we did this um, experiment here in which we assumed that uh, uh, we, we, we put the seat of, of the disease in Madrid and then we measure the prevalence, the number of cumulative cases, uh, 50 days later. Uh, and we did the same sitting the disease in Barcelona. So you, you sit the disease in Barcelona and measure what is the cumulative number of cases in all the province of Spain uh, 50 days later. Um, Essentially, the spreading of the disease is, is reminiscent of the mobility pattern. So if you see the disease in Madrid, you see that after 50 days, almost the whole country have experienced outbreak. While if you see the disease in Barcelona, which more or less demographically is very similar to Madrid, uh, it's the second largest city in Spain, you see that um, the west part of Spain is still at very low prevalence or even uh, have not experienced the um, the outbreak. So that means that uh, the spatial patterns of the disease spreading follows closely the mobility patterns of people in Spain. This doesn't mean that if you wait long enough, the pattern will be similar. And actually, this is the case. If you wait long enough, all the country will experience similar uh, levels of, of disease um, outbreaks or, or disease uh, cumulative cases. Uh, the next thing that we did was to evaluate the effectiveness of different intervention measures. Uh, we explore, uh, for example, a significant reduction in mobility. What was the effect of that? Then uh, early detection of case, detection efficiency, and a reduction of transmissibility. And this is represented in these figures. A and B relate to the mobility reductions. As you will see, uh, if you see panel A, um, the red bar, you see the this corresponds to the baseline scenario when you do nothing. And then if you have 90% of reduction in terms of the outbreak size, you see that it's almost the same. So there is no almost no variation in that. That means that reducing the mobility, even 90% of the mobility is completely useless if you want to stop the disease from uh, to spread the, disease, the spreading of the disease in your country. Even if you turn off different transportation mode, the effect is almost the same. Uh, conversely, if you do, if you look at the days that it, it takes for the disease to reach the peak, 
uh, there is some effect on, on the mobility reduction. Uh, sooner or later, you will get to the outbreak size and you will get to the peak, but if you reduce the mobility, you will see that this is delayed by around 20% uh, or so. So if you do nothing, this is again the red part. If you 90% of overall reduction, you see that this is 120 days more or less. And then there are some variations depending on which transportation mode you switch off. Uh, in terms of intervention, the most effective one are related to um, the detection and isolation of the symptomatic uh, individuals. You see here that in panel C um, that this uh, the number the outbreaks I uh, reduce a lot if you detect very early these cases in one 1.52 days uh, with respect to no isolation and detection. The same happened with detection efficiency. The more people you detect, the easier or the largest is the the reduction in the outbreak size. And finally, if you uh, model the reduction in the transmissibility by wearing mass or keeping social distance, etc., you also see that depending on the level of adoption, the reduction of both the outbreak size and the days it takes uh, for the disease to reach the peaks is reduced uh, proportionally to this um, transmissibility uh, reduction. In this case, the, the, the days to the peaks in, implies that it's, it increases. Finally, what we have done, the, the last word that I would like to discuss has to do with a different approach. In this case, it's Egypt-based modeling uh, because we have data about the geolocalization of individuals in the Boston metropolitan area. So we knew what were the locations at all times. So we were able to build a synthetic population uh, and a synthetic network of contacts, but uh, given uh, driven by the data. So we reproduced the Bostonian population, um, um, we have that uh, we encoded these interactions in different layers. So one is the school layers, the second one is the household layer, which uh, you can extract for census and demographic uh, data. And then finally, this uh, workplace plus community layer that includes uh, uh, workplaces and, and, and uh, community places in which people meet, like uh, you know, a convenience stores or, or restaurants, etc. And then to this uh, structured population model, we couple the disease model that we were discussing, uh, and then we let the system evolve and, and measure a few differences. Ideally, what we would like to do is to connect these two things because uh, this is for a given subpopulation, this, this agent basic models, and the other one was for metapopulation. So ideally, what we would like to do is to have the whole metapopulation system and each of the subpopulations have the structure that we are uh, modeling now through this agent basic model. This is not as easy as is my, is might, might seem, but in principle it could be possible if we have uh, enough data. For the case of, of Boston, in any case, as the city is, was in, in lockdown and the importation of cases is negligible, we can consider that this population is isolated and closed and that we can safely work with only one subpopulation. Uh, the data also reflects uh, the different degrees to which uh, the lockdown reduces the, the contacts. You see in the top uh, in the bottom lines and the bottom panels, uh, the reductions in the baseline scenario. So that means the normal mobility, so you don't do anything. Medium close that implies a reduction in the number of contacts in the community of around 72% and a school closure. And non essential closure that implies 92% of reduction in community plus a school that were already closed. So in this scenario, the mobility, the number of contacts, uh, average number of contacts reduced from 60 some into uh, uh, roughly five or six contacts uh, per, per, per person. Uh, and then what we did was to model different scenarios to try to understand what happens when you adopt different measures. So in the first of these, you see the top uh, row, you see a panel ABC is the baseline scenario when you do nothing. As you can see there, the, uh, the disease circulates freely in your system and then uh, you get to a little bit more than 75% of your population that gets uh, the disease. Of course, this is something that you cannot afford because as we will see in the next transparency, you will see that this completely saturates your system and there are a lot of people that will die just because the system is completely unable to handle that number of infected. 
uh, in the central panels you D, E and, and F, you, you can see what happens when you adopt different measures like, for example, uh, non-essential closure for uh, around uh, two months and then you partially reopen, allowing, for example, a source, etc. And then the full um, reopening corresponds to when you also allow people to go to theaters and other mass gathering uh, places. This reduced the incidence of the disease uh, during the period of the lockdown, as you will expect, but then when you completely reopen your society, again, you have a second wave that is uh, higher than what it was at the, very, at the, the first wave. And this is because you have not been able to build immunity in your population, so still uh, the largest fraction of your population is susceptible and you still have some... Um, infective that are circulating in your system so essentially you will have secondary wave of your of your disease uh, and we will see that again in this scenario even if you go for an incident that is 25 per thousand people to 15 uh, still this is too high for the uh, healthcare system to manage that amount of, of infection. Finally, in the last row, you will see uh, the results corresponding to another strategy that consists in uh, non-essential cluster. And then when you do partial reopening, you also do testing and tracing. Uh, so that you detect people that are infected, the symptomatic people that are infected, and you trace their contact, and then you both uh, both of them get isolated and quarantined uh, at, at the household. So here the key point is uh, regarding tracing. If you do only quarantine, if you only do testing, you see the dotted line that you will have, again, a second wave that is a little bit smaller than in the second scenario because you go merely uh, uh, above nine uh, so it's already uh, another reduction with respect to the uh, panels in the middle but again is is something that you cannot handle so you have to do tracing but tracing doesn't imply that you have to trace all the contacts even 20 or 40 percent of the tracing is enough to get a significant reduction in the level of um, daily infection or incident in your in your system um, the total number of people that get the infection is slowly uh, increasing, so you can handle that in the uh, by your healthcare system. Can handle that. This is something that you can see in the next uh, slide. So uh, panel A corresponds to unmitigated scenario, so baseline scenario. B, if this leads in which you don't uh, do any contact tracing or you don't test and contact trace, you just reopen and let everything go uh, as it was before. And you see that you avoid the the failure in, in the first um, wave, but not in the second one that goes uh, quite above the um, ICU capacity, which is the dotted uh, horizontal uh, dotted line. Um, and finally, if you go for the final, for the third scenario, which you have uh, testing and contact tracing with a level of 40% and you are able to detect only 50% of your symptomatic individuals, you see that you are uh, able to, subs to keep your system safer from uh, overloading it. Uh, the, the ICU beds uh, capacity in this sense. So it, this is a viable solution in terms of people that you have to trace your quarantine. Of course, that needs some more organization work, but in principle, it is doable. Uh, as you can see, finally, in the um, bottom panels, um, the level of contact tracing and quarantine that you, you require for this to work is not as high as, as you will expect because actually for 40% of tracing you get that at any given time the fraction of the population that is quarantined is not that high and actually the peak of the number of people that, that is quarantined is around 9% of the population that is a low very low compared to having 80-90% of the people quarantined when you impose very strict and non-essential lockdown. So this is what I wanted to present and I'm sorry if I took uh, like five minutes more and just want to thank my collaborators uh, on these uh, uh, works um, and the founders. Thank you very much.